Does it make it better because it is a man than if it was a woman? No, not at all. Um, so then why are we deserving a special treatment as women when we publish pictures of men with their genitalia hanging out? Welcome to Tea that I will be having today with noted editor, writer and commentator Ferial Hafaji. The tagline I have chosen for this podcast is If you disagree, come for tea, which is why I have invited Ferial. We are former journalistic colleagues who recently disagreed sharply about the case that the South African National Editors Forum, or SANEF, has taken to the Equality Court in an attempt to extend the definition of hate speech in the Constitution through using the Equality Act. This follows highly provocative remarks made by Julius Malema, in which he particularly targeted journalists in a speech outside the Zondo Commission hearings. Sanef wants this classified as hate speech. However, under the Constitution, in order to be classified as hate speech, a remark must be targeted against people on the basis of race, gender, ethnicity, or religion, and include a threat of imminent violence. If Julius had done any of these things, there would have been no problem in getting him convicted of hate speech in terms of Section 16 of the Constitution. However, in order to get Julius's remarks classified as hate speech, Sanef has to lower the constitutional threshold for hate speech and is trying to use the Equality Act to do so. They want journalists to become a category of people who enjoy more protection against mere hateful and harmful speech than would normally apply. Ferial says she supports this with her whole heart. I have said it is a very bad idea because democracy and progress depend on maximizing free expression, not putting more limits on it. But journalists, in particular, whose lifeblood depends on free expression, should, in my view, never be the ones at the front of the queue trying to further limit free speech, especially when their attempt to do so seems like a case of special pleading, seeking more protection from the law for themselves than others are entitled to. So Ferial, my first question to you is this. Journalists use what could be defined as hateful and harmful speech to people every single day. Why should they be protected from the same? So we're talking about the EFF versus SANF case. Correct. And, um, I guess what you're doing is equating the language of the EFF with the normal critique that journalists would engage every week in their opinion pieces, not in their journalism. So what I've got here is, um, I've been drawing up a list for a couple of years now, of 19 instances of extremely, I would argue, inflammatory hate speech, not only against journalists, but against anybody who disagrees with them um, by the EFF. That language is very different to the language of journalism. I don't think that in our current climate, I don't think in an era where cyber misogyny has become such a rising threat to media freedom that calling for cutting the throats of people, um, for dealing with them, calling upon their followers to deal with journalists, um, and the kind of um, threats we face are the same thing. So I fundamentally disagree with your starting point. Ferial, under the Constitution, Section 16, anything that is, that is defined as hate speech has to constitute a threat of imminent violence or harm. And there are four prohibited grounds of hateful and hurtful speech, but they still have to include a threat to imminent harm. And those four grounds are race, gender, religion, and ethnicity. Now, Malema's speech falls beyond those four prohibited grounds. He may have been talking about journalists, although afterwards he insisted that he wasn't talking about violence against journalists, and he asked people to treat them in a very civilized way, and especially the women journalists amongst them. So he added that proviso, I'm certainly not here to speak on behalf of Malema. But given that the prohibited grounds in section 16 of the Constitution are not met, why should journalists be an extra category? 
So you say that you're not speaking on behalf of Malema. In this instance, everything I think you've written or said sounds like you are coming from exactly the same place and that you are defending his language. So let me go back a little bit. Let me take you to November 2018, outside the Zondo Commission of Inquiry where that happened. The EFF had engaged a full week of what I call the politics of destruction and chaos. Um, and you've seen it carrying on since then. They were there to disrupt the proceedings of the Zondo Commission of Inquiry into State Capture, which is looking and into how our country became kleptocratic and um, such a mess. They were there to do so for a very specific political reason. Um, at some point in that week, they decided that they were going to target the journalists who were covering the commission in a way that felt to them to be biased and aligned to uh, the, the what they call the agenda of the public enterprises minister Praveen Godan who was giving evidence there. So for the entire week they held rallies outside the commission. Absolutely that is falls within their right to free political expression. I was there on the day when Julius Malema began to name the journalists whom he called upon his um, followers there and more broadly to attack. Um, when you say that he then said don't, the way he, where he corrected himself was not, he, what he saw happening was that he, the people who were there began to make really, um, as Max Dupreer said in his affidavit and as I was, and I, as somebody who was there experienced, the crowd became fractious um, and militant against those of us who were there that day. When Malema saw that happening, he rapidly changed his tune. So I would argue that he, in, that he engages a rhetoric which I think is very, very disturbing, and then he pulls back when he sees the impact of his rhetoric. Now, Malema has always engaged in very disturbing rhetoric. There's no question about that. And I would fight with him very hard against the rhetoric that he uses, but I would not seek to censor him. I fundamentally disagree with his rhetoric, and it deserves a very strong backlash, but I don't think it deserves censorship unless it qualifies as hate speech under the Constitution. So there's a huge distinction between defending Malema and defending his rights under the Constitution. And I think we need to draw that distinction very clearly. The old saying, I may fundamentally disagree with what you say, but I will fight to the death for your right to say it. So I would never defend Malema. In fact, no, no one has been as critical of him as I have. But when it comes to defending constitutional rights for everyone, even my worst enemy, I will do that and I will continue to do that. But it's very interesting that journalists have been quiet about, or not many journalists have been quiet for a very long time around Malema's vicious attacks on many other people, particularly, for example, whites, particularly, for example, farmers as a general category. And there's been not only a silence, but often a going along with Malema for the ride. And suddenly, when Malema turned on the journalists, the journalists pulled back and said, this is totally unacceptable. Okay, so let's go back a little bit to what you say <coughs> is Sanaf's path towards encouraging censorship. If you read those court papers, which you have done very carefully, you'll see that the requested remedy is certainly not to say he mustn't be allowed to speak, that he should be censored. It is um, asking the, co the courts to intervene in a particular kind of race of, of hatred against journalists and of a calling upon followers to attack them. I think that's quite a different thing to say that we're looking for a blanket censorship of him, not at all. I think any study of um, media coverage of the EFF will show that it has received fair coverage for the duration of its existence. People will argue, as you have in the second part of your question, um, that he gets too much coverage and that he gets sweet art coverage. Um, that may well be so, but the figures don't don't back that up. It shows that ahead of the election, the EF got, EFF got about 10% of total coverage, which aligned with the, with the political support that they enjoy. Now, you say that the media ignored his pattern of rhetorical hatred against people until it came for us. I would argue that that's not so. And I take you back to my graphic here, which I'm very happy to send you. Mm -hmm. In fact, the media has covered, covered that campaign um, since it started and has given I would argue, quite critical coverage to that language of rhetoric. 
Myself, I've been doing so and noting these instances since I first uh, saw it early in um, 2018, and then we have included every single instance where it's been slitting the throats of whiteness in relation to his language about Athol Trollope, whom the EFF supported mm -hmm. uh, to lose his job as the, the mayor, mm -hmm. um, as a DA mayor in Nelson Mandela Bay, all the way through to August 2019, where the EFF attacked um, Minister Gordon at the podium of parliament. Mm -hmm. So in that includes journalists, many attacks on journalists, but it also includes the EFF's violence against Vodacom, its violence against H&M, all the ways in which this young, interesting party has become South Africa's leading vector of violence. So I don't think in here, in my coverage and in other journalists, do you see us seeking the special treatment uh, for journalists as a body of people. Well, Feriel, I would disagree with you. Okay. And I think especially during 2017, when there was a focus against Jacob Zuma to get him out, yes. the EFF became the heroes of much of the media because they targeted Jacob Zuma in a very, very specific way. And one of the most interesting things is that Adrian Basson, who is one of the journalists who, with Sanef, is accusing Julius Malema of hate speech, he precisely is the one who has written a very interesting piece that appeared in November last year, saying they played along with the EFF. They worked with the EFF to achieve the same political goal of getting rid of Jacob Zuma. And therefore, they were prepared to overlook a lot of his other rhetoric and a lot of the things that he did because he seemed to be working together with the journalists in their aim of getting rid of Jacob Zuma. And he specifically says, and this I find really ironic, the DA was too civil in its approach to Jacob Zuma. The DA was too civil in its approach to Jacob Zuma. So they were prepared to overlook a lot of the infringements of the EFF to almost glorify Julius Malema in the battle as the big champion against corruption, <laughs> against Jacob Zuma. So in Adrian Besson's exact words, he says, we played along, we played along. Suddenly, when Julius Malema is going for the journalists, they don't want to play along anymore. So, this is not Adrian Basson you have sitting here. And to be fair, I think you should be asking will. those questions of him. But we're speaking about um, the Sanif case, so sure. this is but very relevant to it. If that indeed occurred, where people used the EFF as sources, where they felt aligned to them when they did pay back the money and with a political force that in the end uh, pushed and took the case to court, the Nkandla funding case to court. I don't agree with that as a journalist who's perhaps a bit older than a new generation. I don't think you must ever ally, ally with, any political, um, with any political force. Um, but I do think that it's not fair to say all journalists were sympathetic or aligned to or hoist their petard with the EFFs. In fact, many of us have got a different history. My history is at City Press, where we were the first journalists to uncover um, the the corrupt peccadilloes of Mr. Malema when he was still the head of the ANC um, Youth League as the president when he began to uh, show how he would get tenders for companies he was linked with, linked with, trusts with whom his family was linked. So I've never ever had um, that particular history of aligning myself or any way I've worked um, with the EFF. And I guess this is just a continuation of that, that I think the EFF is an interesting party, but it's... Um, its path, its headlong drive to, to a rhetoric which I find can lead to violence is a very dangerous one. You're absolutely right. I should never generalize. No one should ever generalize. And I stand corrected if I did generalize about journalism and journalists because they're very, very different. But let's just look at the five journalists who have taken this case together with Sanif. Mm. Now, you rightly say that journalists should not get politically aligned. And number one individual journalist, together with Sanef, is Ranjeni Munusami. And I think of all the journalists in South Africa that I've ever seen functioning in a political space, she has been the most profoundly aligned and openly and avowedly aligned. So in her own words, she made it her mission to ensure that Jacob Zuma became president of the ANC and beat 
Thabo Mbeki back in 2007. It became her mission. She ran the Friends of Jacob Zuma website, mm. and she was tremendously close, very, very close to Jacob Zuma. She's written her own articles in which she shows just how close she was to the point of writing letters on his behalf and sitting and comforting him in some of his darkest moments. And then when he was elected, she said publicly, my mission is accomplished, basically. She then joined Bladen Zamandi as his spokesperson in government. And when Blade fired her, allegedly, she was hoping that President Zuma would come up for her, which he did not do. And then after that, you saw her alienation increasingly from Jacob Zuma until she's now emerged as his biggest critic and biggest opponent. Now, when that happens, and when journalists have been acting as politicians primarily and not as journalists, can they cry foul? Can they cry foul? Or would that mean that all politicians could cry foul when we are the subject of hateful and hurtful speech by seeking an extension of the definition of hate speech? No, um, many fine journalists have gone on to become politicians, and I'm perhaps looking at the one of the finest here. Um, it, it, is, it feels like it is a common career trajectory. And then they flip back to become journalists, and I'm looking at another fine example. <laughs> yeah, you're becoming a journalist once again, or you, you're crafting um, a life for yourself as perhaps a, a talk show host. Um, <laughs> um, and so I think that's what happened to Ranjani. She became, in my opinion, too aligned, in her opinion too, too aligned to the Jacob Zuma project. And when she saw how corrupt that was, she went into hibernation for a long time until she used her political smarts to re-emerge as an analyst and a journalist. So I don't think we can um, tag people forever um, because people do shift and they do change. Um, and if you look at the affidavits of all five of our colleagues who sought this action, um, where you are coming under a particular attack, and I don't think that this is captured properly in your columns, is that online, journal, online social media platforms, notably Twitter and Facebook, they've opened up fronts um, in, this, in that harm media freedom in ways that we couldn't have imagined even five years ago. Each of those people, Ranjani in particular, Poli van Weyck, my colleague at the Daily Maverick, the, t the attacks on them have become so difficult it makes them makes it impossible to do their work. Um, with each of them, you've seen that those attacks have morphed from social media into the real world, mm -hmm. um, where they have felt themselves to be endangered from doing their work. And for me, that's something a little more deep that we have to think about um, as we go forward. Does the solution to that lie in the courts? I'm not sure. Does it lie with the platforms? Increasingly around the world, there is a view that Twitter, Facebook, Google, Amazon need to be doing a lot more about this rising threat. I think these are all very unforeseen consequences sure. of what was supposed to be a democratizing platform. But let's go back to the exact case that Sanef is taking. Sure. Sanef is saying the grounds for hate speech defined in the Constitution is not enough to protect the journalists in the context that we're talking about. So we want to use the Equality Act, which defines prohibited grounds. Yes. And there are only four prohibited grounds in the Constitution. There are 17 in the Equality Act, which raises the question of whether the Equality Act is even constitutional. Sure. But journalists want to add, or the journalists who are taking this case, and Sanef, who speaks on their behalf, want to add occupation as another category. Now, if occupation was added as a category, obviously it would include politicians. And then, for example, if Zapiro were to draw a cartoon of Lady Justice being raped by Jacob Zuma, that would be hate speech. So we would massively close down the space for cartoonists, for political debate, for the tough challenges that we get all the time. Equally, on platforms like Facebook and especially the gutter and the sewer of Twitter, well, what passes there for speech is just horrific, often by trolls and specifically by bots and sock puppets who are driving particular agendas. Now, I know because I think I was a target a long time before most journalists were, 
And I'm again very interested that when people have been targeted in the most vicious way for such a long period of time, often the journalists joined into that choir, went after the people, made a huge story of it, magnified that outrage often by twisting and distorting and decontextualizing what people had said. And then later on, when they become the target, say, oh, oh, this has gone too far. We need special protection. Um, so I suppose what you're speaking about is your series of tweets about colonialism's, leg the colonialism's legacy. legacy yes. Um, and I think that I was one of those people who first spoke out and said, you have every right to your opinion. And what we need is intelligent debate and not shutting down. And that's why when Sanef decided to take this case, we are not a bunch of censorious people. In fact, I think we walk on the shoulders of giants like Joe Tlolwe of Raymond Lowe, people who've really ta taught us our uh, media freedom spurs. I think we sit in an extremely different context where at the time, the targeting was getting so bad that we were becoming scared to do our work. So for example, after that November 2018, um, series of, of attacks on Twitter, many of us could not go out and cover the EFF leading up to the election because it was unsafe for us to be at their rallies. It was a, a deeply considered action. I'm still not sure that it is the correct path to undertake because what you could end up with is a dampening and chilling down effect of free expression. We are extremely cognizant of that, which is why it's my view that the better lobbying, the international lobbying that journalists need to do is with the platforms. Because really it's their job to make those places ones of civil discourse. My experience there has been a very difficult one. When you are attacked on Twitter, if you try even get death threats, if you try and report it uh, to the platform itself, um, you really get a, a note back saying this is within the rights of free expression. Ultimately, I think the solution is going to lie with those global platforms and how they treat the trolling armies on it. Um, there's an additional consideration which I hope that we could discuss. Around the world, be it from the Philippines to Mexico to Vietnam, um, trolling armies have shown that they can alter um, the politics of a country. Yes. The biggest example, of course, is in the US and perhaps even with Brexit. But what happens in countries with even less regulatory protections than those ones. Zambia, mm -hmm. for example. Kenya was targeted by Cambridge Analytica. And for me, it's those bigger picture threats to democracy, which I increasingly find myself interested in. Yes, with the rise of social media, we've had this phenomenon of the manipulation of it, and it turned into an industry. So Cambridge Analytica, there are troll farms all over the place set up, and they use people's personal data, often taken from Facebook and other social media platforms, to target messages very specifically at people with the aim of influencing their behavior, specifically in an election. So the allegation is that the Trump campaign had a whole lot of sock puppets driving messages against Hillary voters, pretending themselves to be black voters disillusioned with Hillary in order to get black voters to stay sure. away in the election to up Trump's vote. So that is people deliberately being deceptive and pretending to be mm. people they aren't. And that is a whole new area. Now, I have often complained to Twitter about very egregious threats, death threats and other things. And I must say that they have taken them down. And also when there was this expose of Cambridge Analytica and I approached Twitter and many other people did, I lost 50,000 people off my timeline, thank goodness, overnight as they were removing the fake yes. accounts. Now, the big problem with the fake accounts is that they don't just send a tweet here and a tweet there. They function as a network. They do. So even a small number can completely distort the debate out of all proportion to their numbers. And this is the big challenge. And that is definitely what happened to me because I've had my timeline analyzed on more than one occasion. Sure. And I'm sure that it happened to you. The question that I'm asking is, why do journalists, or many journalists, because it's wrong to generalize, why do many journalists play along with those evil games of Cambridge Analytica and others when it's targeting someone they want to target and cry foul when it's targeting them? 
So I'll step back a little and just show you how I think we have a mini Cambridge Analytica help taking place in South Africa at the moment. I think we have active troll farms being run by the so-called fight back campaign um, being staged against President Cyril Ramaphosa. And that's a collection of forces. It can look like ANC stroke EFF, including SASCO. And I think they're feeding off the fact that we have such a high unemployment rate. You can probably buy young people to click and to, to be your trolling army. Uh, you see it happening in Nigeria at the moment. And I think it's implications for our democracy and for who gets into power and how tolerant we are of state capture is a story that's not even begun to be written. So it's really something that's where proper investigation and resources are necessary. Otherwise, the implications can be particularly hurtful to us. Why is it that journalists can sometimes play along with those viral crowds? I do think that the era of social media has both been kind to journalism and it has been enormously destructive of it. Um, in my opinion, mm -hmm. as an older journalist, there's far too much opinion going on and mm -hmm. far too many um, uh, journalists who are exercising those opinions because it's far, far easier to do it. You just need this thing in your hands and you become an actor. And often journalists are influencers in society. They have very large Twitter or Facebook followings and they, I think, enjoy the power of having people go along with you. In my own practice, and I can only speak for the sum of one now, is recognizing that you can do that requires a very deep think on our parts of how do you bring your ethical code into your social media practice. So for me, it's meant thinking very carefully. And when I comment on something, I'll say this is a comment. And if I'm doing news, I'll say this is news. And for me, those are practices that more and more of us have to undertake and also be careful to understand that you not only have um, the power of the pen as it was in the old days, the power of mass media, but where you have large followings, you can be destructive on social media. Um, that's not a popular view, I don't think. Um, and it is something that probably Sanef's leadership will have to apply itself to. How do you take your, your practice as enshrined in the press or the broadcasting code of ethics and apply that to your work on social media? Well, I think that's a very interesting question. I'll come back to it right sure. now. But being hateful and hurtful isn't unconstitutional. Sure. Only when it isn't accompanied by a threat of violence does it become unconstitutional. That doesn't mean to say it's not very hurtful. And it doesn't mean to say that cyberbullying isn't a real thing and can really wreck teenagers' lives in particular, which often happens, or young people's lives in particular, that often happens. But the very interesting point that you raise with this comment is that who is a journalist today? Anyone who can grab a phone, go to an event, and start tweeting in 280 characters is reporting on something and can often take things out of context or get the wrong end of the stick or whatever. But if one starts including journalists as a category under Section 10 of the Equality Act, who is a journalist and who isn't? And if everyone can be a journalist simply by picking up a phone and going to an event and starting to tweet, then wouldn't the clamp down through making journalists a special category under the Equality Act really undermine free speech in a very broad way? Well, we'll see what the judge says about that. But equally, I would pose to you the challenge is, how do you make sure that journalists are able to do their work? So the EFF, I would argue, needs a balanced and credible eye looking at its activities. Otherwise, its story will only be told by its four million strong following. If you count that of all its, its leaders, it really knows how to use social media very well. And if those people feel threatened from covering them well, that too is an act of censorship. Um, probably not either of those are correct. Maybe the court case is not the correct one to follow, but I do think as a society, we need to look at this rising threat to media freedom where you very well can censor coverage of your own activities by attacking us in the way that happens almost every single day. And it's against um, 
a very specific and targeted group of people who have cast a more critical eye on um, the EFF's um, pic peccadilloes in its uh, path to corruption, in how it accesses money, all of which I think are, are vital questions um, to be asked. I think that many professions face growing threats. And I do think those threats are exacerbated by social media, as you rightly say. The great challenge comes in including that word occupations, because occupations don't end with journalists. They cover politicians, they cover accountants, they cover quantity surveyors, whoever you like. And indeed, social media is a platform which can be used to incite fear in many people's hearts, and is. So it does create a new category a very important new category for the thinkers of this. But again, we don't want something to become a threat to democracy because free speech is what drives progress. Sure. We do not want something to become a threat to democracy that should be advancing sure. democracy. Now, I want to switch the subject for a moment and say this. You and Adrian and I think Peter Bruce and perhaps one other person took a very innovative step. You have laid a claim against AIG Europe Yes. For the harm and the defamation done to you through the Bell Pottinger network mm. in South Africa. Can you say a few things about that? How you were able to establish that it was Bell Pottinger and how you pursued the case and where it is now? Mm, sure. Um, so it's interesting that as we speak, Lord Tim Bell died yesterday. Oh, sure. Um, and sorry, that, sorry. I mean, that's really an end of an era. Mm. Um, I think he perhaps ended it in a fashion that's similar to Gavin Watson, where you belie your positive legacy by what you do at the end. Um, so how did we find out it was Bell Pottinger inside leaks? Um, people who were unhappy in the company at what they were being made to do were leaking, and we got hold of that information. Mm -hmm. And also by tracking the work of the bots, very clever people like your Arthur Fraser, like Carl Findlay, like Jean van der Merwe, were able to look at how the bots were operating, um, how they were using stock photographs that could be purchased, and how they were all tweeting a similar message. You could also tell by who Atul Gupta was following. That was a very clear, but clear way of doing it. how did you know they were Bell Pottingers? Because I have um, mine analyzed exactly the same way. Yes. They were exactly the same thing. How did you know they were linked to Bell Pottinger? Uh, because the insiders had told us that they had been um, in charge of such a campaign, and Lord Tim Bell in interviews has afterwards said that they had um, devised the campaign. So have you published the full list of the fake accounts so that the rest of South Africa can look at whether they were targeted as well and put in a claim against AIG as well? Not really. I think Kyle's done some of the best work on that, and that was published, but we didn't uh, publish long list. Can I speak about the claim? No, but, that, no, but that's a very important thing, yes. because, again, this looks like special pleading on behalf of journalists. I don't agree with you. Well, we, put put the work, we put the work <clears throat> out there, and it's if you click on the graphs that Kyle, for example, has drawn up when we did uh, the first big study of misinformation, you can find all the accounts there. Okay, because I'd be very interested in that. He's also I don't done think it's special pleading at all. Okay. No? Well, we've got four journalists who've gone to AIG Europe yes. to say we were particularly harmed by Bell Pottinger and we deserve damages. Do you know what we've there said? We'll do with the damages. We'll give yes, it to no, Senate. Give right? it to so Senate. it's not about enriching. No, it's not enrich okay? enriching yourselves. Mm. You said you're going to give it to Senate. That's fine. It's but just I think we have to keep attacking these disinformation campaigns I completely whenever they agree. come up. Yeah. whenever they come up. Yes. And that means not only on behalf of journalists, but on behalf of the public Do you know, Helen, large. it took hours and hours and hours out of our lives to bring that case. To be honest, I don't have those hours to do a class action. There are other players in society who may be able to do no, that. But other people, if they knew that these, these, these uh, accounts were linked to Bell Pottinger, would have done that themselves. No, but it, if, you, if you click on all the information we've published, you could see the account. Okay. And I argue that if people want to be active citizens, then they should be active citizens. Absolutely. And no one has, in fact, studied this more than I have. Sure. So when I get out, because I also have a particular interest in doing yes. so. And I've also followed a lot of other people who mm. faced exactly the same thing. The tragedy is that in the meantime, a lot of lives get ruined and a lot of consequences happen. And often you find that people with opponents play along with the bo uh, bots and the trolls and even put up front accounts themselves to achieve certain agendas. 
But what I want to, to also yes. add is this. Achieving certain agendas. You've also answered, I think, very empathetically about Ranjani. Very empathetically about Ranjani. And I'm always in favor of giving people a second chance. There's not a person in this world who hasn't been given a second chance. But it seems to me a big issue when people don't mind destroying other people's lives, but claim a second chance for themselves. Now, let me give an example sure. here of that. When Ranjani wrote that there had been an investigation into whether Bulalani Muka had been a security police spy inside the ANC, that effectively, I think, ruined his life and saw the end of his tenure. And the Hefe Commission found that it was without substance, and Ranjani refused to give evidence there. And subsequently, I've read in Times Digital, which seems to be a reliable story and has never been rebutted, that the background of that story came from Jacob Zuma himself, who was then under investigation by the National Directorate of Public Prosecutions. And the Scorpions had apparently asked Jacob Zuma a whole series of questions about his role in the arms deal corruption. And the journalists wanted those questions. They wanted to know what they were. And so allegedly, Jacob Zuma said to Ranjani, to whom he was very close, I will give you those questions if you will place the story that Bulilani Nguka was a suspected spy, which he then tried to do in her newspaper at the time, the Sunday Times. The Sunday Times turned it down. She then had it published in the city press. And she was fired for her troubles, understandably so. But the extraordinary Machiavellian politics behind a journalist agreeing with a politician to publish something that could not be verified and potentially destroy a person's whole life to advantage the politician who would then be able to say, well, the scorpions are leaking stuff. They must have an agenda against me when it was actually he himself who was leaking it. Isn't that so Machiavellian as to be beyond the kind of misstep that one could consider for a second chance? <laughs> So you really should be asking that of Ms. Munzami. No, but I'm asking you as a you're principal. You're welcome to. you welcome to. I'm Ms. asking you as a principal because Ranjani is one of the forerunners in the Sanef case. I mean, she's not peripheral to this case. She's not an individual. She's standing up with Sanef to argue the case for journalists. Surely that is a critical case to answer if journalists are asking for special pleading. If they're saying we're a special category because we can't do our job otherwise unless we have the special extra protection that shouldn't apply to politicians, that shouldn't apply to ordinary people. It needs to apply to us because we have to do our job. Okay, let me take a step, but I think it's an unfair question. Okay. You should be asking it of her. Okay? Well, you were um, protect, you were defending yeah, Sanif's case. Okay, I'm happy, to, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I saw Bulelani Muka last week at Mkabisi Jonas's book launch. Mm. He looks fine. His company's doing great. I'm not saying that he wasn't subject to Machiavellian action, not at all. But he has bounced back in the same way that Ranjani has bounced back. And I would argue that she did pay the price. For many years, she didn't have a job. I do think that she has written to explain, to try and explain herself. If you do say you believe in a world where people must get second chances and be able to be rehabilitated, then we have to really love that principle and understand that that is somebody who has done that. Are we then saying because of what, what had happened that she should be subject to the most appalling um, attacks and cyber misogyny and rape threats because of her past? I don't agree with that. I don't want to live in a world like that. It's and while and not because of her and past, while, it's and because while of the we present. See, and while we are speaking, it's because of the present, I think in her present that she has more than made up for, for what has happened and that she's a fine member of our craft. Now, there's something else I want to take up with you. In your 
first article afterwards, you said something like, uh, after something I did, oh, put on your big girl panties because this is this is a day on this is the, a day on the job. And later you said that because I had complained, I was sounding wimpish. Now. What kind of world do we want to create? Do we want to create a patriarchal world where we must just be subject to abuse, where we must kind of, women must pretend to be men? Or do you want to create a world where we treat each other like, where we treat each other with civility, even with love? I would prefer to live in that world, where people do get given a second chance. I certainly would love to live in a world where people behave with civility and are decent. And I have to be honest that I try most times with decent people to be civil and decent. There's no you weren't with me, and I've always been civil with you. Saying something wimpish, saying that something's wimpish is not uncivil. Fine. Saying that something's wimpish I think wimpish it's uncivil, but it's you, within your rights of free speech. Eh? But, well, I don't think it's uncivil. I mean, we've got different criteria sure. around uncivil. But I never said, put on your big girl panties. You said that. I think that would have been uncivil, which shows you that people have different criteria sure. for uncivil. And I don't think that being tough is patriarchal at all. I think women can be just as tough as men and can be just... I think you are holding up a male standard. A male standard? Mm. I only hold up my standard. I don't, uh, I don't... What is a male standard and a female standard? I think what you were saying is don't, claim, don't proclaim, don't claim, don't write that women face a particular form of violence on social media, which I would argue that we do. It's sexualized, it's gender-based... It's particularly violent when it's an attack of, and I've studied the, what's happened to women journalists, not a special claim, but there is that regard. And I think you were saying that cannot be. It's all equal. Hmm? Well, let me say this, that um, in one of the sexualized portrayals of me that was, written, that was actually painted as a huge artwork, I think bought by Kenny Kunene, he said to put in his bedroom. I couldn't think of anything more disgusting. That was a highly sexualized drawing with myself in the most vile position. I mean, you had it yes. mild compared to me. Oh, of course. <laughs> yes. Yes. Your, your position was kind of Leopold there, as they say in Afrikaans almost. It's all awful, but Helen. Yeah, we don't have to create these gradations of I violence. You, yeah. I, I tell you, there are gradations of violence. That's why there's a definition of hate speech. Fine. But in this particular, in this particular thing, there were two males also with their genitalia on display to everybody. And what's more, when you were the editor of City Press, you ran a picture of Jacob Zuma with his genitalia hanging out. Does it make it better because it is a man than if it's a woman? No, not at all. Um, so then why are we deserving a special treatment as women when we publish pictures of men with their genitalia hanging out? I think that there were different levels of power in that Brett Murray painting. It came at a certain moment in time. I do believe that the sexualized attacks on women journalists, the gendered attacks on women journalists, are recognized as being uh, particularly pernicious and that can drive women journalists out of political journalism and investigative journalism. And this is written around the world, um, reported everywhere from the Philippines, uh, to Vietnam, to the US, to Europe, it's recognized that this is a different category. I certainly think that sexual harassment is a great threat to women in professions everywhere. Um, and this may well be a, a very large part of it as well. And I do believe in being civil, and I do believe in being decent, and I think Twitter is a sewer. But I also believe that when people behave viciously, it is appropriate to fight back and to give them what they deserve without classifying what they say as hate speech and prohibiting it if it does not meet the criteria of the Constitution. So the Masuku case tomorrow, which went around anti-Semitism, for example, and has already been through a couple of hearings where the courts disagreed, the Masuku case tomorrow, which is going to be heard, is going to be pivotal mm. because that will really give us a good insight into whether Section 10 of the Equality Act is constitutional or not. Yes. And that will change the whole ballgame in our understanding of the SANEF case as well. Sure. Um, I think that how we define um, hate speech across Pepuda, across the Constitution, across in the equality courts, in various pieces of legislation, is sorely in need of, of thinking. Because at the moment, what you have is a, 
a double standard. You have last week's case on free expression as it relates to the old flag setting a certain benchmark and on the other hand you have four human rights commission findings in relation to the EFF uh, where, where the human rights commission found that the language of the EFF was not hate speech and why did it find in at least two of those cases it said because Julius Malema is black he has a higher um, tolerance to he has a higher tolerance and right to free speech than other people in South Africa. That's outrageous. Do. So across the board, you have these different definitions. And where I do agree with you is that we are seeking some clarity. And I hope when we draw it, we draw it quite wide. Well, I must have missed the Equality Court saying that because Julius Malema is black, he can be more vicious. That in was the Human Rights Arabia. Commission. The I Human can Rights send that Commission. To you. I mean, mm. that is totally outrageous. I, I do find it outrageous. And that's got to be unconstitutional. I mean, it goes against the Equality Clause. Mm. In the it has never been challenged, but I find that those findings well, it needs very to difficult. Be. It needs yeah. to be challenged. Mm. But you see, what I find much more interesting is Sam Kelo Makine of the Freedom of Expression Institute. He is, he often expresses my view on this issue, on everything from the flag to this other issue at the moment. He says that really vile, hurtful, hateful speech is not hate speech unless it fulfills certain requirements which must involve an imminent threat to, of violence. And so that is where I think we should come down if we're trying to protect free speech in the new democracy, which we're going to need more and more. And ironically, which journalists are going to need far more than the EFF's ever going to need. They would squash free speech tomorrow if they had half a chance. But journalists need to protect it and absolutely guard it. Sure, it'll be boundaries. interesting to see what the court comes up with. We have had these very debates in SANF, but I say to you again, we only took it when it became clear that this was impacting on our ability to work and making it dangerous for us to work. I get that, and I think that it's also, and I, I'm very, you know, it would have been hypocritical for me to say that before because I had bodyguards. Sure. So, I mean, when you've got bodyguards, and they did save my life on about three or four occasions, most other times mm. I was fine, but they did, and I was very grateful for them. But certainly I don't have any bodyguards now. Mm. And, Neither uh, do we. Yeah. I, I have found it incredibly difficult to work with bodyguards on the one occasion I had hard. them during the spear. I would rather not as a journalist. Mm. Yeah. Well, of course, I would rather not either. Mm. And often, well, I had agreements that when I was on my own time, when I was a premier, I also didn't have them, which was absolutely right. But this is a tough place, you know. Um, it's a tough continent. It is, it's a tough space. And we're trying to become a democracy mm. that upholds Totally, You values. know, we don't have a country where telco companies are forced by the government to cut off the internet, as you've seen happen across our continent eight times this year. Except and I agree with EFF's you. Except protesting in we Parliament. Have to, we have to protect those spaces. Absolutely. Um, this wasn't an easy case to take to court. I'm sure it wasn't. And uh, in fact, that's why so much hangs on it. Sure. And that's why I think it's been massively underreported. And that is why I like the fact that you raised the issue of double standards, because there is so much double standards in South Africa. What some people are allowed to say, other people aren't allowed to say. What is outrageous in some circumstances is fair comment in other circumstances. And we're a young democracy. We're battling through these issues. We're trying to get to a point where we come to some kind of common understanding and build one nation with one future where there isn't demonization of minorities, sure. where there isn't a complete marginalization or attempt to other certain groups. Sure. And in South Africa, that is often the case. And minorities in South Africa are quite different from what they are, say, in the United States. And to adopt all of the rhetoric that goes against whites in the United States in the South African context is extremely dangerous. And so these are some of the debates that we have to talk through. And I'm sure. really glad that you came to do that. With Thank me you today. very much. Thank you very much. Thank Helen. you, Helen.